did just now. Uh, they're blue. Ah, uh, there's uh, kingfishers are blue, blue jays are blue, and tree swallows are blue. Uh, but the bird we're talking about is bluebirds, and everybody really likes bluebirds because, uh, first of all, they're cute as a button. Uh, they're not aggressive, not like crows or blue jays or even mockingbirds sometimes can get very aggressive to, around bird feeders. These guys are nice and calm and relaxed. They're very tolerant to humans. You can, they, you can have a nest box uh, right in your backyard and you won't scare them away. Uh, you can get close, you can look in the box to check on them. Uh, and they're, they're very tolerant to living around humans. Uh, Here's a winter picture, they're male, uh, deeper blue. These guys all puffed up because it's cold outside. There's a female, look almost exactly the same, except they're just a little uh, less blue. And, um, and then there's a male and a female together at a suet feeder I have in my backyard. Uh, he's yakking at her, but uh, they, you can get real close to them. I don't know if you could hear that, but that's the sound they make. Uh, just a little chirp. They, they make that in the male calls, trying to attract a female in the early spring. And uh, they're all, in the winter, in the winter I had nine or 10 coming to my suet feeder every, every day, or meal, they'll come for mealworms. Uh, then about three or four weeks ago, all of a sudden, instead of nine or 10, I had only two coming. In the winter, they're all nice. they hang together as a group, but come come mating season, they start to pair off. And a pair will choose a, a nesting site, and then they protect that site for about a hundred yard radius against any other bluebirds. They'll let other species in there, but uh, they they won't let another bluebird pair there. And the reason is, it's that's their hunting territory. They don't they don't want to have to compete for food because they bluebirds hunt in a certain way. They'll let other, other species in there because they hunt differently. But uh, this time of year, you, if you have bluebirds nesting in your yard, you, you can put two boxes up in your yard. And unless they're on either side of the house or at least 100 yards apart, uh, you'll only get one pair because that first pair will defend their territory. But bluebirds, as cute as they are uh, and as tolerant as they are, they, they really need our help. And here's why they need our help. Um, this, I, re I read this quote, and this was true for me. And, and this quote said, in the 1980s, if you were under the age of 40, you guys can count on your fingers and figure that out here now, you had probably never seen a bluebird. And for me, that was true. Uh, and back in the early 80s, my dad decided to build a couple of bluebird boxes. And I, I knew what bluebirds were because I had the bird books and, and nature books and everything. And I said, but you know, we've never, we don't have bluebirds here. We've never seen a bluebird. And, and my dad said, well, I've read that if you put a box up that they'll find it and they'll come. I said, I don't know where they're going to come from. We don't have any. Well, I put two boxes up and then next summer, son of a gun, we had bluebirds. Uh, and the reason we hadn't seen any, it was, Back around 1900, there used to be about 20 million. It was estimated there were 20 million eastern bluebirds in the United Eastern United States, but by the 70s they had declined up to 90 percent. They went from 20 million down to two million bluebirds, and uh, you, you know why did that happen? Well, there were two main reasons: were house sparrows and starlings, uh, and then the third reason is loss of possible nesting sites. But that went along with house sparrows and starlings. House sparrows sometimes called English sparrows uh, and starlings were, were both imported from Europe. And there's a couple reasons. One, one story is that uh, there was somebody that felt that every bird mentioned in Shakespeare ought to be brought to the United States. And so he brought some over and released it in Central Park in New York. And then another story is that there was some kind of worm that was eating trees in New York and um, they brought house sparrows over to maybe eat the, eat the worms so that it would save the trees. The only problem was house sparrows are primarily seed eaters. And so that experiment didn't work. But house sparrows and starlings now have expanded over the entire United States. They're the two most popular birds in the United States. 
and they've taken over. They're also cavity nesters, both of them. So they took over most nesting sites that bluebirds and other cavity nesting native birds needed. And their house sparrows and storms are very aggressive and they'll chase away other birds from sites and they'll actually kill other birds. Uh, and I'll talk to that just a little bit more in a, in a second. So the populations decline. There's the house sparrow male. And if you wanna see, if you don't know what these are, go to your local Kroger's or Food City or McDonald's or Burger King and they are in the parking lot. These guys are generally around buildings. They're around farms because they're primarily seed eaters. And if you have horses or cows, they'll be there picking out the seed that they find on the ground. That's generally where they are. We don't usually have them in our neighborhoods around our in suburban neighborhoods, but we do so. Uh, that's the male. The female um, looks a little different than that. She, it's, she looks like, these look like sparrows. Uh, they're not really sparrows, but they look like sparrows. The, the female, as opposed to native sparrows, has a, a, a plain breast, not a streak breast. So that's the house sparrow. And then these are starlings. You know what these guys are. Uh, and they're, uh, they're a problem also. But now eastern bluebird populations now, these days, we're back to 20 million. We went from 2 million back to 20 million. Well, that's kind of a miracle. So how did that happen? Well, the number one thing that helps bluebirds is build them a house. Uh, humans cause the problem by importing a non-native bird to cause problems. We, we fix the problem by building them houses where they have a place to nest. And if we build these houses and put them in bluebird habitat, they will come. Uh, what bluebirds like is open grassy areas like your front yard or your backyard. Uh, they love golf courses, city parks, anywhere where there's short grass and open areas. Uh, it, they don't particularly live in the woods or heavy fields because the way they hunt is they sit on a low branch of a tree, maybe a, a, a rain spout, a first story rain spout, maybe a lamp post at the end of your driveway. And they spot an insect on the ground and they jump down onto the ground and catch it. That's how they hunt. You'll see them sitting on a low branch and go into the ground to hunt. Um, and so you put a, a box in your yard, that's perfect bluebird habitat. If you put that box, if you have a wooded backyard and you put that box into the woods, you're more likely to get a different bird, a chickadee or a house wren. Um, they're also cavity nesters. Uh, they, we put them around golf courses. Golf courses are perfect for bluebirds. And I'll just give you one example. Yesterday, I, uh, I went out to a golf course and we monitored 16 boxes that we, we only put on that golf course this about a month ago. It was a golf course, never had bluebird boxes. I went out yesterday of the of the 16 boxes, um, 13 of them had bluebird nests in them. Two had tree swallow nests and one was empty. Just in a month, bluebirds found them. Now, where were those bluebirds, where they nest last year? Well, they may not have nested because they couldn't find a place to nest. Uh, if they can't find a hole or a cavity to nest in, uh, they, just, they just don't have a chance to nest. Here's a, uh, here's a box in my front yard and a uh, bird leaving there. So I mentioned briefly about what they eat and they're insect eaters, not seed eaters. Uh, if, if you have bluebirds try to eat seed at your bird feeder in the winter, that bluebird is very, very hungry and can't find anything else to eat. So 70% of what they eat is insects, uh, a, a lot of caterpillars, uh, maybe small spiders, especially when the babies are first born, they, keep, uh, they feed them small, soft things like small spiders. And then grasshoppers, katydids, crickets, those kind of things. Um, and in the winter, they, they live here in, in Tennessee. They don't go south, any further south. They stay here. Uh, in the winter, they find fruit to eat, like dogwood berries, holly berries, uh, and they'll eat pokeweed berries. Uh, even though they're poisonous to humans, uh, as they get older, the, uh, bluebirds love them. Uh, and in the winter, they can find insects in the winter. They can find insects under bark or, you know, on a warm day, you'll see insects flying around. Uh, but they can get through without us uh, just nicely in the winter. Uh, the only thing that'll hurt them is an ice storm that covers everything. And a couple of years ago, up here in the plateau, we had an ice storm in 2015 that covered ice, covered everything for about five days. 
and we lost a lot of bluebirds that that uh, that winter. They recovered. Took two years for them to back get back to their population, but an ice storm can hurt them in the winter time. So here's here's a bluebird with the something I eat a lot of. It looks like a cutworm to me, possibly. Um, they eat a lot of caterpillars, feed a lot of them to the babies. Uh, and here's one with a Katie did, and it's amazing. You can um, some some people have cameras in their bluebird boxes. I had one a few years ago. They can take a big old Katie did and stuff it down the mouth of their baby. You think it's going to choke them to death, and they can they can take it in, eat it, and everybody's fine. So that's the kind of things that they eat. Uh, they'll come to your they'll come to your yard to eat mealworms. Especially they love me live mealworms. You can buy live mealworms at like a feed store, or I get them online. They come in the mail. I buy a couple thousand at a time. Uh, you put them in a little container, put them in your refrigerator, and it'll last for months. Feed them once a week some carrots. And every day I put a few out. I don't feed them too many uh, because mealworms can be calcium depleting. And if you're, if you're just feeding that, that bird mealworm after mealworm all day long, they'll eat them. They'll love them. But that's like you eating Pierre Masu every day all day long. Uh, you need your vegetables and your minerals. And so uh, I just feed them a few every day so they can come and get photos and so forth. But they need those hard-shelled insects that they catch out in the lawn uh, for their calcium and other minerals. So don't overfeed them. If you see a bluebird come and eat mealworms, uh, they'll gob gobble them right down, one after another. If you see them load up their beak like this, you know they have babies because they'll load them up and then they'll fly away. And a minute or two later, they'll be back and load up a few more. Uh, and they take those of their babies. Uh, and then it, during the early mating season, before, before they build a nest and so forth, uh, the male and female may come together to a mealworm feeder and the female sits there and looks cute and the male will pick up mealworms and feed them to her one at a time. And you, you know, that only happens during dating in the early days and then after that she's on her own, but that's kind of cute to watch when the, when the female just sits there and opens her mouth and the male will feed her. They'll eat dried mealworms also. They don't like them as well as live mealworms, but dried mealworms are a little easier to handle. You don't have to keep them in the refrigerator. One morning, my wife left our dried mealworm container out on the deck, and the female tried to come and figure out how to get in there. And then when the male came, she said, these are mine. Get out of here. Uh, so we, we don't leave them out there, kind of teases them. They'll come for suet also. They love suet. Suet made out of lard, especially. You make some homemade suet out of lard. They love that. Lard is an animal fat, kind of like an insect fat. So they, they'll come for lard in the wintertime. And, and, and all woodpeckers uh, also, as you know, like lard. Uh, that's a, they're also an insect-eating bird. So those are kind of some of the things that they will eat. Well, if you have a bluebird box in your yard, I mean, it may happen. It happens out in the woods in the tree, but when they're in the yard, we see it a little closer up. And predators are a problem for all animals, uh, but bluebirds uh, are susceptible, especially. And here's some of the main. Here's some of the predators of bluebirds. The top two are the top two. Gray rat snakes are number one, and raccoons are number two. Gray rat snakes. Some people call them black snakes or black rat snakes. Uh, they can climb up anything. And if you have a box on a four by four post or on a, a pole that doesn't have a predator guard or on a fence post, uh, you're inviting rat snakes and raccoons. They'll, uh, and if you have a box that had babies or eggs one day and the next day you look in and everybody's gone, but the nest looks like nothing touched it, it's perfect. That was a gray rat snake. They come in, eat the babies or the eggs and they leave and the nest looks like it's undisturbed. And, and you wonder where everybody went. Well, they went in the, they went for lunch to the gray rat snake. Somebody just called me this morning. They had a box and uh, they, they called me a month ago and they said, I, I'm gonna, I don't need a prayer guard. Well, they put it on a four by four post this morning, all their babies are gone. If you have a box in your yard and you look out and you see the nest pulled out of the, pulled out of the hole or laying on the ground, that was a raccoon. They climb up the pole, reach in the hole, pull it out, and they'll eat everybody. House sparrows, I mentioned, are a problem. They don't, they don't eat bluebirds, but if they catch a bluebird on the nest, they'll go in the hole and kill the mother 
and the babies and just leave them there. And sometimes they even build their nest on top of the, the, the babies and the mother that are dead. Uh, they, want that, they want that cavity. They want to build their own nest there. So house sparrows um, are a particular problem. And the best way to solve a house bar sparrow problem is to not locate a box where house sparrows are. Um, and if you have house sparrows uh, in your neighborhood, you're going to be fighting them. Uh, there are some things you can do. You, you can read up on. Uh, they're hard to can keep away. House wrens are a native bird. You can't harm them. But, uh, and I'll tell you about them later here, uh, they will poke holes in bluebird eggs or tree swallow eggs or take them out and drop them on the ground or take out day old babies and drop them on the ground. Uh, and I've had two of those cases in the last week uh, from house wrens. If your box is near a brushy area or near the woods, you're more likely to get house wrens. And flying squirrels, um, regular gray squirrels don't cause a problem with bluebird. They can't get in the hole but uh, flying squirrels can go right in that hole. They'll kill the mother and they, they eat nothing but the head. And that's how you know you had a flying squirrel problem. And again, that's a locate the box away from big den trees and, and you've solved that problem. Uh, so those are some problems. Usually we don't have problems, especially we don't have problems if we have predator guards, but uh, always gray rat snakes or raccoons are always looking for a meal. These are some other things that can cause problems. I'll tell you about them a little bit. Uh, another one about, uh, about bears in a minute. House cat, if you got an outdoor house cat, uh, you're asking for trouble. They'll, they'll jump in the air and pick a bluebird out of the air, or they'll jump onto the house and reach inside and pull, pull everybody out. And I've got stories that people tell me about. They had some beautiful bluebirds, and then their cat got them. Um, so those are, those are a couple issues. There's a gray rat snake. They can be five, six feet long. They can climb anything. And... Uh, they're, they are, they can be, that's the number one predator in Tennessee of bluebirds. They can climb a four by four post like it's not even there, get in the box. Here's a real, real sight when you open a box to check on your bluebirds and you're, there's a snake looking at you. We have 300 boxes that we monitor up here in Cumberland County. And last year, twice we've opened the box and looked at that. Um, and that, those were boxes that we didn't have predator guards on. We can't always afford. With 300 boxes, we can't afford to put predator guards on all of them. Um, so we put them on the ones that are most likely to have problems and add them as we can. Raccoons, I told you about them, you know about them. So here's the best, here's the cheapest, most effective predator guard that, that we use. You get a two inch stove pipe from Home Depot or Lowe's and you can look it up. It's called a Kingston predator guard. And you can look up how to make it. You can make it yourself. You can make one for less than $10 and place that on a pole. It has to wobble and it can keep, it, it's 98% effective against raccoons or rat snakes. I've had one in, 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 I think five or six years, I've known of one rat snake that was long enough and big enough to wrap around that thing and get up to the top. Uh, and I don't know of any raccoons that get a, uh, got up there. So it's, it's very effective. Um, and I always say, you don't have to have that on there, but if you don't, you can expect you're going to have trouble. Maybe not the first nesting, maybe not the second, maybe not this year, but you're going to have trouble. This is what it looks like installed. Uh, you have to put it kind of high on the pole. If you put it too low, the snake can get across it. If you put it too low, the raccoon can get across it. So that's as low as we ever place them. Sometimes we replace them a little bit higher than that. That's a Kingston Predator dog. Here's another guard we can use. Some places like on golf courses, we can't use Kingston Predator guards because they they want all the boxes on four by four posts because it looks better. Kingston Predator guards get hit by golf balls and get all binged up and look terrible. So we do what we can. And here's what's called a knoll guard. You've seen these probably. It's a wire cage. It goes around the hole. The bluebird can go right in through there but raccoons can't reach in. It sticks out, catches them under the arm, they, their arms aren't long enough. These have to be at least six and a half or seven inches long because uh, if you look up online, it'll sometimes say make them five and a half inches deep. Uh, mm -hmm. We apparently have run into some long armed raccoons up here because uh, we've had trouble. So we now make them six and a half, seven inches deep and we haven't had any trouble raccoons get by. Rat snakes, this does not stop them, but that, That'll help you with raccoons if you, if for any reason, you can't use a better guard. Here's one, there was no, there's no hope for this one. Uh, 
the, the person where this box was called me one morning and says, uh, I, here's a picture. Come down. I don't know what happened to the box. And I took one look at it. I said, I think I know. Let me come down. I went down and it was a bear, a black bear. There was five eggs in there. There were five eggs in there the day before. The black bear uh, just ripped the box totally off the pole, ripped it in half. That's how strong they are. Ate the eggs and left it there. And I know that's not the first case. I, that's the only one we know of, but I know one, a friend of mine had the same thing happen. So uh, I don't know of a guard to keep the bears off, but that that's another predator. Cooper's hawks, as you probably know, Cooper's hawks and sharp shin hawks are bird eaters. And especially when the babies are first fledged, I call them teenagers. They think they know everything, but they don't. And Cooper's hawks, uh, that they, they sometimes pick off the, the newly fledged babies. Uh, and they can get adults also. I know one case where somebody watched as the mother flew back to the box with food for her baby. And right behind the mother was a Cooper's hawk. The mother flew in the hole, went in the box. The Cooper's hawks went up to the hole, reached in, grabbed the mother, pulled her out, and flew away. And then another time, there was uh, there was an... I don't know if you can hear that. Another time, there was a barred owl at right at dusk, and somebody looked, and the barred owl was trying to reach into the box to uh, reach out and, and pull out somebody to eat. Uh, it didn't get them, but a, a no guard, the wire cage, would have protected against the owl and the cooper sock, doing what I said. For insects, there's insects that can get your ants, so the number one problem, they'll, they'll build a nest right in the bird's nest. Um, earwigs get in there. Um, Blow worms uh, can suck blood from the babies. Once a nest is built, we sprinkle some diatomaceous earth underneath the nest and that protects against insects. It's non-toxic and we'd wait until the nest is completed. So the bird isn't dusting in it when it's building the nest. But once the nest is completed, we sprinkle a little diatomaceous earth under the nest and that has helped with any insect problems. So if you put a nest in your backyard, you usually get bluebirds. You know, sometimes I'll put a nest up and someone will say, well, how soon can I expect birds? I, I say, you know, you may have them there in 15 minutes. And th that's happened many times. The other day I put a box in someone's yard. I got in my car. I didn't drive a mile away. My phone's ringing. They said, there's a bluebird checking out the hole already. They see a hole and they want to check it out. And so, um, uh, uh, you know, and other birds do too, but bluebirds especially, boy, they seem to be looking for a hole in a tree or a hole in a moss. So if you look in your box and you see moss, uh, it's most likely a Carolina chickadee. And that's a native bird. We let them, we let them live there. Um, they only have one nesting, one brood per year. And so once their babies fledge, we clean out the nest and then that box is available for bluebirds the, the rest of the summer. So uh, Carolina chickadee, you know what they look like. There's the babies. Uh, if you look in your box and see that, we love to see that too, because that is a tree swallow uh, nest. Tree swallows uh, are fabulous birds. Uh, and they, we get them, we have, a, we have eight golf courses, we have boxes. Uh, one of them, we have lots of tree swallows. The other ones, we might have one box or two boxes of tree swallows out of 15 or 20 boxes. Uh, but if you get tree swallows, they're just as cool as bluebirds. Um, they, they have white eggs, but every once in a while, a bluebird will have white eggs. We have one box at the uh, UT Ag Center here in Crossville that uh, there's a pair that two years in a row has had white eggs. And we have another at uh, Roan State College campus here that uh, uh, there's a box that a pair has had white eggs uh, and they were bluebirds. So don't, every once in a while we get fooled. Tree swallow nests always have, always have feathers in them and lots of feathers. And they're usually duck feathers, not bird feathers, not, not songbird feathers. Uh, and that's how you, you know uh, it's a tree swallow nest. And there's a tree swallows. And just like bluebirds, the, the babies all hatch on the same day because bluebirds and, and tree swallows will lay one egg a day and only after they're all laid do they sit on them. And therefore they all hatch at, on the same day. So these babies have hatched so that last egg, they're gonna have another brother or sister here in a few minutes or 
Every once in a while, it may hatch on the next day, but that is extremely rare. Usually it's all the same day. And every once in a while, like I think it's 10 or 12% of the time, an egg doesn't hatch. And often the, the, the birds will take it out and throw it away. Sometimes it's there until the baby's fledged, doesn't cause any trouble. If you look in a box and see a box full of sticks, that is a house wren box. They're a native bird, we don't harm them, but they'll fill every box. The male will fill every box or every hole he can find with sticks and then hope to attract a female to one of those boxes. Well, if, if it's just sticks, we take them out and we hope that the male will chew, the female will go nest in the woods because we don't like to have house wrens nesting near bluebirds because even though they don't kill bluebird, well, they do kind of. They'll, they'll take bluebird eggs and, and uh, poke holes in them. Uh, they'll take eggs and throw them on the ground and they'll take day old babies and throw them on the ground. Uh, house wrens, if you see uh, eggshells under your, under your bluebird box, it's most likely a house wren problem. Uh, somebody just called me this morning about that. They had eggs. What 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 was the deal? Uh, house ran. They they uh, they caused trouble. So we we clean out the sticks. If we get there too late and the, the female has built a little nest on top of the sticks, then we leave it because it's a native bird and it's not legal to harm native birds. So we let it. But we try to get the sticks before they nest there. And I don't know if you can do that. But that's a Carolina red. They don't, ne we've never had any nest in a nest box. They possibly could, but, but they, they nest in cavities and they nest in your barbecue grill or a, a, an old boot left on your porch. They nest in crazy places. They cause no trouble. They don't cause any trouble. Only the house wrens do. And if you look in your bluebird box and you see that, you got trouble because that's a house sparrow nest. They fill the box. I, usually, it's a real loosely put together nest. It often has weed seed, weed heads in it and um, paper, plastic, even cigarette butts sometimes. And they some, some sometimes they fill it all the way to the roof. Uh, you have sparrows and you got trouble because uh, you can take that nest out every week and every, every week there'll be another nest in it. And we know that because we have house sparrows living at the Discovery Garden area of the UT Ag Center here. We fight with the sparrows and try to keep them under control, um, but they're they are trouble. House sparrows and starlings are non-native species. They're the only songbirds in the U.S. that you can legally kill anytime you want. And a lot of people don't like to hear this, but when we are monitoring bluebirds, we kill every house sparrow we can because I always say you either kill the house sparrows or they're going to kill your bluebirds. And when you open a box and see a bluebird mother all pecked to death around her head and the babies all pecked to death, um, you don't have any trouble killing house sparrows. They, they, if it was a hawk that killed a bird in order to eat it, I don't have any trouble with that. That's nature, but these, and this is nature, but we don't like it when they're just killing them for the heck of it. So we, we try to take care of house sparrows. There's a house sparrow eggs in the middle of a nest. They have feathers in it and everything, but that's house sparrow eggs. And if you look in your box and you see something like that, you have flying squirrels. Uh, we don't have that often, but every once in a while we do. So what goes on inside that box? Well, you guys are a little ahead of us down there in the southern part of the state, but here, our, our bluebirds uh, up here on the plateau start the nest about the last week in March. And by the end of August, all the nests, all the babies have fledged. They nest two or three times every summer. So as soon as they nest, as soon as the babies leave the nest, we clean out the nest. And then within a week or two, the female builds a new nest and has another brood. That happens two to three times every year. And, but by the end of August, everybody's gone. Uh, and um, last year, I think we had one nest out of 300 that had babies in it until the September the 4th, and then they were gone. So at that time, we clean out all the boxes and um, wait until it happens all again next year. Egg laying takes five to seven days, depending, usually, uh, they lay one egg a day. Usually the first nesting of the year, they have five, sometimes four. Second and third nesting, usually it's four eggs. It takes 12 to 14 days till they hatch. And then 16 to 21 days after they hatch, they, they fledge. Usually it's about 16 or 18 days later they fledge. They never go back to the box after they leave. Once the babies leave, they will never go back. 
fun thing that happens at bluebird boxes. Their nest is very clean until the last day when the parents are trying to call them out to fledge. When, but the, all the rest of the time, when the parents feed the babies, they and as soon as they feed the babies, most of the time the baby just turns over, puts his butt in the air, and poops in a little sack, which the parents grab, take it away, and take it far away so predators don't find it and know there's a nest nearby and drop it. So the nest is very clean until the last day when the parents aren't going in there. They're just calling the babies. And then the last day when you take the nest out, there's usually a ring of bird poop around the top of the nest because the parents weren't cleaning it out when they were just trying to get the babies to fledge. Kind of a neat little thing. But when you see that happening, you know what's going on. So why, why would you check on boxes? Uh, normally we check here. We check here always once a week. Uh, and and um, we have monitors that go out. Uh, we have 18 different trails and 300 boxes and we check every box once a week. You, North American Bluebird Society says twice a week is good. If you're checking every day, you're probably uh, disturbing them too much, but uh, once a week is a good time. So what do you do when you check? Well, we, we take any house sparrow nests out of there. We check for insects, put into diatomaceous sort earth, of make repairs. Uh, we record everything that's going on, how many, whether it's a four complete nest, how many eggs, how many babies, how many fledged. And then we report that at the end of the season up through to the Tennessee Bluebird Society, which goes to the North American Bluebird Society, which goes to Cornell University, which studies, and that's how we know about how many bluebirds are, how they're surviving and how they're doing. And then we always clean out the old nest. As soon as the babies leave, we clean out the old nest. So there's uh, some of the things I just told you. Uh, once the babies are 12 days old, and if you're monitoring weekly, you'll know about how old they are. Once they're 12 days old, you have to be careful looking in because they might jump out. And if they do, you can put them in a hundred times and they'll jump out 101. Once they've seen the outside world, they won't stay. So you, you don't want to let them jump out um, too early or they, they won't survive outside. And when they leave the box, sometimes they fly to a low bush or low tree. But many times I've seen them first flight come out of that hole and fly 100 or 200 yards to the highest tree in the horizon. Just uh, it's amazing that they can come out of the box and fly that way. And then for the next two weeks, the, the father will mostly feed them. Both of them feed them, but mostly the father. While the female recovers, uh, builds a new nest and gets ready for brood number two. So there's me checking a, a box. Uh, this box now has a predator guard on it. It didn't when I took that, when somebody took that picture. So we open the box. We like the boxes that open down so we can peek in without anybody falling out. Many boxes you'll see you can buy, they open up, and that's, you have to open it wide open in order to see, and that's a little bit of trouble. Here's my wife trying to look in. She's not tall enough to see in the nest, so how can she tell how many eggs are babies? We first, when we first started this, we'd take a step stool of some kind, and that didn't work. Uh, what we found that works beautifully is to take a mirror. We hold the mirror above the nest. And it's just like being up there looking straight down in the nest. Works beautifully. You don't have to disturb anything. You can see what's going on, count the eggs, see the mother, uh, use a mirror. So if you look in, that's a typical bluebird nest. They use dry grass often. Um, and that's a typically looking bluebird nest. Nice, very neat, uh, and usually pretty much all one material. They also use pine needles. Here's one that they've used, white pine needles. Uh, those are the two things that they generally use all the time, dead grass or white pine needles. Uh, there's a mom sitting on a nest. Sometimes they fly out when you open the box. Sometimes they sit tight. Usually the bluebirds fly out. We can then count big eggs and babies and see what's going on. By the time you get 100 yards away, she's back in the box. So it's usually not a problem. Day one, this baby hatch, brothers and sisters are on their way. Day three, they're getting bigger, getting fuzzier. Day eight, they're starting to uh, get a lot of feathers. Day 11, day 14, they're, they're about ready to fledge in the next couple of days. And then when they fledge, they fly to a tree and they're all speckled like this. And they're hard to see. You have to follow where the parents are going with food to see where they are. And there's, a, there's, there's one that's come back to my business in earworms. 
they'll come back to the deck and for the first couple of weeks, they'll sit there with mealworms crawling over their feet and not knowing what to do with them. And the, and the father or mother has to feed them. And then eventually they figure it out. This is the age where they're most susceptible to get picked off by a hawk. So here's some opportunities. For, so I've told you everything uh, uh, about them now. Here's a, but I don't like to leave without giving you some things that you might want to do. Opportunities. Number one, you can attract bluebirds to your deck or your backyard with sewer mealworms, especially live mealworms. Once they find that you have mealworms, they'll come every day, every morning. And if you don't put them out, if you put them out every morning at seven and you don't put them out, they'll be looking in your window wondering where the mealworms are. Uh, so that's one way, you, one thing that you can do. You can put a nest box in your yard. If you've got a neighbor that has one uh, right next to you uh, and you put one in your yard and they're, they're usually, if they're within a hundred yards, only one of you are going to get bluebirds nesting there. They may switch boxes back and forth only one at a time. So look around, and if you if you got an opportunity, you could put a nest box in your yard. Third thing is you might want to join in the Tennessee Bluebird Society, and um, and things just changed down there about a week ago because of. If you join the Tennessee Bluebird Society as an at-large member, just go on the website and apply to join the Tennessee Bluebird Society. It is $15 a year. But you now have a local club that just started in April. So, uh, and, they, and for, to join that local club, it's only $10 a year. That covers your Tennessee Bluebird Society membership as well as your local club membership. So that's a heck of a deal. And the reason it's lower priced is because a club has to have so many members. So that club down, it had just started down there. Now down, uh, uh, they're calling themselves the tri-state chapter. Uh, they have 25 members already. Uh, and for $10 a year, you can get involved in that. Um, there's three people. Some of you might know some of these people. Uh, Allison Hoffman is kind of taking care of membership right now. Uh, Lisa Lemza, some of you people know. She's involved in wild things and so forth. And Carlton Mathis, I, under, I think he uh, comes to your meetings sometimes. He's kind of main box builder down there. And he, those three are kind of the, the three that kind of got this club started down there. So if you're interested, uh, or even if you want to know anything more about it, here's, here's Allison's contact information. Allison, uh, I kid her that she doesn't know how to spell Allison, but it's with one L, Allison Huffman with no vowels on the end at gmail.com, Allison Huffman. Or there's her home phone number. Get in touch with Allison if you're interested in joining the local tri-state chapter, getting involved. They have already identified at least three bluebird trails. And, and it, it, this month, they're going to be installing bluebird boxes in a number of locations. And you could possibly be a monitor. You can help make bluebird boxes, monitor boxes. There's lots of opportunities to get involved and have some fun down there. We started up here in Cumberland County with eight members, and now we have 110 after a couple of years. So it really grows. And when we when we have people that are monitoring, we have 80 different people that take turns monitoring Bluebird once a week. And we we have a waiting list for people wanting to be monitors because no one, once they become a monitor, no one ever, ever quits. They love it so much. So there's some thoughts for you there. And then if you wanted to, one step further, you could join the North American Bluebird Society. And here's, a, here's something. To join the North American Bluebird Society, it, it's normally $30 a year. But if you join the Tennessee Bluebird, Bluebird Society, the first year is only $15 a year. And so, so, for, so there's an opportunity. You get a magazine four times a year with the North American Bluebird Society. It is fantastic. It's got tremendous articles about bluebirds, how to attract them, how to um, improve box building, how to protect against predators, what's going on in other places. Fabulous magazine. So there's, that's the fourth thing you can do. And, and if you want to check out NA, North American Bluebird Society.org, there you go. And so there's my contact information. Uh, if anybody has questions afterwards, I do great with email. Uh, there's my email address, don period or don.hazel at gmail.com, and my telephone number. And that's it. So um, uh, any questions, I'll be glad to answer either now or email me, and I'll be glad to help you with any questions anybody has.
Thank you so, so much. That was so interesting um, to listen to and to, to see all those photos of the birds developing and their life cycle. And who knew there was so many intricate details. It almost reminds me of beekeeping in a sense where you're checking on um, the boxes for pests and um, issues that could be happening. But uh, I have the chat box open here and I'll kind of act as a bit of a moderator for you, John, and I'll, I'll read the questions off to you and we can kind of take them one by one here. Um, our first question asks, must you attach a bluebird box to a pole? Can it be attached to a tree or does that make it vulnerable to predators? And well, so here's, I'll give you uh, what I tell everybody. The absolute worst place you can attach a bluebird box is on a tree. That's the absolute worst place because ants, mice, rat snakes, and raccoons say, oh, there's a bunch up, there, up on that tree, and they all can attack, go up there very easily. So that's the, 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 the tree is the worst place. People have them on trees. They get bluebirds and so forth. They, you know, but uh, on trees is where we get the most trouble. So I would, uh, I, I really encourage uh, people to put them on a pole with a predator guard. That is the safest thing to do. Um, the, the woman this morning that called me was almost crying that the snake ate her babies last night because oh. they, uh, they were on a, a four by four post. Uh, you can get away with a pole, a post or a, um, a tree for a while, but eventually, uh, I always say, eventually trouble's gonna happen. Okay. Um, our second question asks, can you address other habitat needs? Water, pesticide free, uh, insect producing plants and trees? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bluebirds blue love water. They, uh, that, they, they need water that attracts them. They like to have a bird bath nearby. And as you know, most birds like running water. So if you have a bird bath that has a little fountain in it, they like that even better. And here's something that most people don't think about. Even in the winter, birds need water. And when it's frozen, uh, they can't get to it. So that's, yeah, water is good. Uh, somebody asked me yesterday, could they plant weed in their yard? And I, I said, I don't know why you'd want to. It's kind of, uh, you know, spreading wild, crazy plant. But, but you could, you know, they eat uh, holly berries. They eat um, dogwood berries. Yeah, you could plant very, and you'd have to look up more than that, what kind of trees or berries bluebirds might like. You could, you could do that. Most people really don't want to attract insects to their yard. I hate to see it when people have their yard completely sprayed for insects. Uh, I, that, you, you know that, uh, yeah, I know you get ticks in your yard and that's a problem, but um, I, I just hate to see that when they completely put permethrin uh, or whatever, all over their entire yard. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't like to use a lot of chemicals. We never use any chemicals in a bluebird box. Um, so yeah, you can uh, probably the easiest way to attract them is put some mealworms out. They'll find their own insects in your yard. Um, so yeah, and I hope that answered that. And this next question is a bit of a twofold question. It states, do the nests always have to face, face east? And then what if the nests aren't cleaned out? Okay, two great questions. You often read the nest should face to the east. And the reason for that is most weather comes from the west. And so if the weather's coming from the west and the rain is coming in at an angle and goes in the hole, it can wet the babies in the nest and they can die from hypothermia. So that's why it says the face to the east. Um, we have 300 boxes. They face north, south, east, and west. And of the 300 boxes, I can count on less than two hands the number of boxes that didn't have successful birds last year. So it doesn't matter which way it faced. When I make boxes here, I, I go look at the plans of the North American Bluebird Society website. They have a lot of plans at na, na bluebirds. Uh, dot org. Um, I make the roof bigger than it calls for. So it overhangs on the front more and it protects the birds from uh, rain going in. But that's why they say face them east. Um, now here's, I tried something yesterday. I'll tell you how next week I might tell you. We had one box at the golf course I checked yesterday that had no birds in it. Every other one had bluebirds in it or birds or tree swallows. 
that box was facing west. So I said, let's just try something here. I spun the box around to face east. Now that's a you know scientific experiment of one, which is not valid. But next week I'll see if that made any difference. But maybe they didn't like the way it was facing. It might have faced, you know, maybe they like it faced a more open area or something like that. But north, south, east, west, to me, I found does not matter. Uh, as far as the nest, if you don't clean out the old nest, a bluebird will build right on top of the old nest, or a chickadee will build on top of the old nest, or a bluebird will build on top of a chickadee nest. The problem with that is two, two problems. One, the second and third nest gets right up near the hole where anybody can reach in and grab them. A blue jay, a crow, an owl, a hawk can reach right in there and grab babies. Uh, even a raccoon can get past a, a, a wire cage because the nest isn't at the bottom right near the hole. So that's a problem. But another problem is that old nest has a buildup over a month of lice and mites, maybe blowworm larva, um, that are all parasites to the bird. So uh, we always say it's, it's important to clean out the old nest for a couple of reasons. So there's never, never a reason to leave the old nest in there. Somebody today, I told you, called me and they had a red had taken their eggs and dropped them on the ground. It was a monitor who was monitoring. They emailed me and said, what, you know, I, I, left, the, I left the nest in there because it was looking good, but the eggs were on the ground. And I said, no, we need to take the nest out of there because once that, those eggs were destroyed, um, that the bird isn't going to reuse that nest. Um, they'll build a new one. So there's no reason to leave an old nest or even a predated nest because they'll build a new one. Do indigo bunting birds and Eastern American bluebirds use the same nesting in food? You know, I don't know a lot about indigo bunnings. Um, I I see uh, there's one in my yard once in a while, and there's one place where we we monitor. And I see a bunch of indigo bunnies in that location for some reason. I, I'm not I'm not aware if indigo bunnies are um, um, cavity nesters. Uh, let me tell you though, of last year in the state, in the state of Tennessee, of, of over a thousand nests, a thousand and thirty five nests that Bluebird Society monitors. Uh, we had uh, no tufted titmice nests, even though they're cavity nesters. Uh, I believe they'd like a higher nest, higher up in the tree. We had no tufted titmice. We had no Carolina wrens. Uh, we had no, um, it, it was mostly bluebirds, tree swallows, uh, Carolina chickadees, house wrens. Up near the Kentucky border, we had a couple profanatory profanatory warblers. I can't even say it. Uh, I don't even know what they are, but we don't have them here. They're, they seem to be up near Kentucky border. Uh, mostly it's bluebirds and tree swallows and house wrens. And not, and not, it's mostly bluebirds, tree swallows, and Carolina chickadees and a few house wrens. Yeah. Oh, one, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, I, didn't, I don't know if I stressed it. Two really critical points of a bluebird boss. These, these are one, they're not one and two, they're both number one. And if you don't have both of these, you got problems. A bluebird box has, needs a hole that is an inch and a half in diameter. That's the key, an inch and a half. That excludes other birds like starlings that'll get in there and kill them. Uh, doesn't include house sparrows, but inch and a half is the diameter. Not smaller, not bigger, inch and a half. And the other thing is if you have a bluebird box that does not open, uh, it's, it's basically, uh, good for one season and you might well put it away because, or fix it so it opens because you got to clean your old nests out. Uh, if you don't clean them out, I, you know, I said they'll build on top, but eventually those old nests, they get rotten, they're full of parasites. You got to have a box that opens. It's got to be an inch and a half hole. Those are one and two. And then also here in Southern Tennessee, it's got to have ventilation. And if you look at the boxes I make, people will say, well, you're not very good. Uh, the crack, there's cracks in it. Those cracks are on purpose for ventilation. If you see a box that has very tight tolerances uh, and there's no holes in it except the one and a half inch hole in the front, it's a bad box because down here we need ventilation or the birds will cook in the summer sun. How high up a pole does the nest need to be placed? A, a very good height is five feet for the hole. Uh, for two reasons. One, that's a good height that bluebirds like. Five feet's a good height. Um, and five feet is a height that we can easily see in and monitor the birds and, and count what's going on and keep track of it. So five feet is a very good height. If it's higher than that, if it's six feet, then I can't even see in. You gotta, you're gotta, you going to have to use a mirror. Uh, bluebirds will still 
like it okay, but five feet to the hole is perfect. The way I, here's the, here's the way I mount them. And, and you'll find instructions on this online and stuff too. I get a five foot piece of rebar, half inch rebar, five foot long section, pounded into the ground, usually about a foot, foot and a half. So now the rebar is sticking up probably four, four feet tall or three and a half feet tall. I then take a five foot piece of three quarter inch electrical conduit that you buy at the hardware store and slide it right down over top of the conduit uh, over the rebar. The conduit goes in the ground, maybe two inches. The rebar is the strength that holds everything straight and the conduit is give us, gives it the right height, five feet, and then you mount the box on top of that. How to keep the Bluebird box entrance from being expanded? What is causing this and how to prevent it? Yeah, so how can you stop the Bluebird box, um, the entrance, from getting larger? Oh, okay. Why is that? Okay, it gets larger. The hole gets larger for two reasons. Uh, woodpeckers or gray squirrels. They'll chew the hole bigger sometimes. It doesn't, for us up here, it hasn't happened very much. Uh, um, uh, it happened, I know, twice with gray squirrels last year and once with woodpeckers maybe. They, they, they can't get in that hole, that, that inch and a half hole. So they're making it bigger so they can get in there. Uh, so if that happens, rather than try to replace the whole front of the box or something like that, I take a piece of wood, the same kind of wood the box is made out of, one inch thick, Make a square of that wood by about three inches square. Put an inch and a half hole in the middle and then put that right over the larger hole, which now makes the whole, the whole now you have a double thickness uh, and makes the hole uh, an inch and a half again. If that box already has a double thickness, I take the, the, you know, the piece off that's already on there and replace it with a new piece that's an inch and a half. That's all you have to do is just cover that hole with an inch and a half replacement hole. And I will say, um, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, um, we have a master gardener in Hamilton County, uh, Carlton, who makes bluebird boxes, and he even puts a metal ring around his yes. ring, and yeah. that is his preventative for yeah. the hole getting bigger as well. Now, I know two Carltons down there, Carlton Mathis and Carlton's, Carlton with a K. Mathis, I'm pretty sure. Okay, yeah, Carlton. Carlton is the major box builder for the new local tri-state chapter. And yeah, uh, I believe he, I, I saw the boxes. They made 21 boxes last Sunday and they plan to make more. And I, I think I saw some of them. You can put that uh, metal ring around there. That keeps the, the gray squirrels and the woodpeckers from making the hole bigger. But we haven't found a need to do that. I, as I said, in 300 boxes last year, I think the gray squirrels chewed too. So I just put a replacement over that. I try to keep the price of the box is under control. And so I try to not, you know, those metal part cost more money. So I don't use those. Can we do anything to keep the birds warm tonight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can, you, yeah, you actually can. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, yeah, you can, you can wrap the box, not except for the hole, obviously, in something like bubble paper, bubble wrap, or you know, some kind of uh, insulating material. Yes, that that uh, that that's a technique. It's not weird. It's a technique that some people can do. We can't obviously do that with our three hundred boxes, uh, but if you have a box in your backyard, yes, you can wrap the box. That'll help. Uh, if there are vent holes, as there should be for ventilation, you can block those vent holes, uh, and and that will help. Um, in the winter, uh, you know, from August, the end of August until the in March, the boxes are not used. But in the winter, some every once in a while on a cold night, a number of bluebirds, like eight or ten, will go into a box and huddle together to keep warm. And if you you don't know which box that's going to happen to, but if you if it's happening in your yard, you can wrap that box. And some people do that to keep them warm. Some people even put roosts on the inside so they're not all jammed together in the bottom and they can kind of space, space out in there. Uh, so, yeah, you can wrap the box to keep it warm. But let me just caution everybody here. Last year uh, at this time, all over the state of Tennessee, we lost babies. And we didn't lose babies that were one, two, or three or four days old. And we didn't lose babies that were 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 days old because when they're tiny, the mom will keep them warm all night. When they're older, they got feathers and they can hopefully keep warm themselves. 
But we found out last year when the babies were somewhere between eight and eight days old, they were pretty vulnerable. They can't regulate their own temperature at that age. And uh, they may be too big that the mother's not keeping them warm all night. So last year, I think here of our boxes, we lost like six or eight boxes of babies that were that age. We didn't use, lose the long, younger ones. We didn't lose the older ones. And then when we had a um, conference call for around the state, we found that happened all over the state last year because we had a cold spell. I'm really concerned that this cold spell last night and tonight is going to may cause the same trouble. Uh, I'm, I'm going to caution all of our monitors that next week, you know, be prepared for uh, hopefully not, but be prepared. It could be a bad night for bluebirds tonight. Uh, PVC pipe that, that it's another that, you know, I mentioned Kingston predator guard, the two foot stove pipe, the PVC pipe. If you get, um, if you have a box that's five feet high and you get five feet of PVC pipe, white PVC pipe, that is six or eight inches across and slide that down over the pole that you have the bluebird box on. And a lot of people like to wax that with car wax. Uh, I've, I haven't used those, but I, I know people that do and they, and they claim that that's very effective also, that it's too wide and slippery for the raccoons and the snakes to get up there. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to try some of those, but that is another accepted uh, predator guard. The cone guards that you buy at a retail shop, uh, I, you know, I think they can be effective, but I do know of a number of cases where snakes have gotten by those. And I don't know the size that they got by, but uh, I would say the Kingston Predator Guard and someone mentioned the PVC pipe, that's a good suggestion. That, that can work also. Awesome. Um, can I a comment? Yes. Um, on my PVC pipe, it's only about two to two and a half inches wide. Okay. And uh, what I do is I put a small piece of uh, one and a half or one by one piece of wood on the back of the birdhouse. And then I just strap them on to the PVC pipe. Okay. And they're about five feet high or fairly close to five feet high. I also put them a bit of a distance away from the, the trees so that the... Uh, Squirrels and things like that can't hop down from the trees and orn to the top of the birdhouse, things like that. And we've had our birdhouses out there now in the PVC pipe for over two years, and it seems to be doing really well. David, that is another good suggestion you had. We have a golf course that have, we have 35 boxes on this golf course. And the reason we have so many is there's lots of tree swallows, so we can put boxes closer together. Uh, we have... Kingston guards on every one of those boxes. But last year, a snake got in one. I thought, how the heck did that happen? That box was under a tree and the box were, and, and the limb hung over the box about three feet above the box. And we determined that the snake came up the tree down across the branch. So you mentioned you keep it away from trees and so forth. Yes, a raccoon or a snake um, can reach across, uh, uh, a snake can reach across probably three feet. Uh, 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 and yeah, you got to be, even though you have prayer guards, sometimes they come from above. Good, good point. Yeah. And uh, again, thank you so much, God, for what a lovely presentation. Here's what I've read, and I can't vouch for this, but I read that, you know, if you put two boxes up, you won't get, obviously, you're not going to get two sets of bluebirds. But if you put two boxes up, I've read that you have a better chance of getting bluebirds because they like a choice. So they'll see two boxes, they'll check them out and maybe pick one. They, they it could be that there's another box um, within a hundred yards or uh, somewhere nearby. And that's why they're not there. But it also could be, you, you know, sometimes I put up boxes of people's yards and they didn't get them uh, until uh, maybe next year. Or, and sometimes they'll, they've already, they're already in the nesting for the first brood here now. So when that brood is done, those birds are going to want to nest again, maybe in the same box they just nested, or maybe in your box that doesn't have anything right now. So don't give up hope. Uh, if you've got a, a good habitat, lawn area, open area, and a box with not a, another box too close, uh, chances are you're going to get them. It just might take uh, second or third nesting or maybe, maybe even next year. Okay. Well, thank you again so much. This was awesome. I wrote down some of the contact info for um, the Bluebird Society and uh, – things of that nature. So guys, thanks for showing up. And Don, this was awesome. I Thank you guys. Okay. Have a great one, guys. See you. Bye. Bye.